was a champion at uh, UCLA and, of course, five-time All-Star. He's also a great actor, which we'll get into that coming up in a moment. He's Marcus Johnson, the Bucks TV analyst for Fox Sports Milwaukee. Marcus, thanks for joining us. Um, what did you think last night when you saw the Greek freak go up to contest Clint Capella? Well, good morning, Dan, first of all. Um, you know, it, 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 it reminded me of, a, of an injury that I had when I played with the Bucks. I got kicked trying to contest a jump shot by a player by the name of Paul Thompson of the Cleveland Cavaliers in the early 80s. And my knee hyperextended back like that, got locked. It was the most painful injury that I've ever had as a basketball player. But I went to the locker room, Jeff Snedeker, our great trainer in Milwaukee at the time, worked on it a bit. And I actually returned in the second half. And Don Nelson told me he thought I was going to be out for the year based on the on the reaction that I had. And so to see Giannis kind of loosen it up a little bit, walk on his own was was promising. But, um, you know, everybody uh, started texting me right away. And it's kind of like, why does this always kind of happen to us? Why can't we never have good things in Milwaukee happen to us? But, you know, we got to wait and see what happens. I'm, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, if, if we can extend this thing to a seventh game, maybe he can get back. If not, you know, we'll see. We'll see what the MRI says today. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm not ruling him out right now until I hear definitively that he's got uh, some kind of a tear or something that's going to prevent him from playing. And it might come down to the supporting cast for the Bucs against the supporting cast for the Atlanta Hawks. And if that's the case, who has the advantage? Man, that's a tough one uh, because of this, Dan. And, and, and let me preface this by saying that I'm just really – impressed with the job that these African-American coaches are doing in the playoffs between Ty Lue and Monty Williams. And, and then my guy, Nate McMillan, I was with him in Seattle. Uh, you may recall with George Carl and the Sonics in, in the mid mid nineties, I used to always compare him to Sidney Poitier and call him Mr. Tibbs. Cause he's got that quiet kind of elegance <laughs> and dignity, but, but they call me Mr. Mr. Tibbs. Tibbs, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but Nate, you know, this whole thing, but connected like a fist and you know, the, the calming influence, I think, is a big key for them. But but more tangibly, uh, Bogdanovich, the knee, speaking of knees, the knee is looking better. He looked really good, really mobile, especially uh, his activity on defense. Herder, uh, uh, Kayvon or whatever they're calling him, has been a real a real revelation. I've always liked it, but now he's kind of taking his taking that step to the next level. Uh, and you go along with the other guys who are playing exceptional basketball for them. And then Cam Reddish. It's funny, Cam Reddish, I was talking to my son, Chris, and he's like, Cam Reddish is the guy, like, like uh, the, he's the guy that all the young players kind of look up to. And uh, Anthony Edwards says that Cam Reddish is that dude. You know, I didn't know that. I know Cam Reddish had that kind of reputation hmm. kind of coming up in the AAU ranks. He looked good last night. So we've got enough. Chris Middleton, and, and here's the other point. Now, I don't want to get too long winded, but you got a lot of guys, Kendrick Perkins, Stephen Jackson, talking about Chris Middleton is the Batman and Giannis is the Robin. Now Chris is our closer because he can shoot and shoot with the best of them down the stretch. Now we'll get a chance to see uh, just uh, how truthful uh, of, of an observation like that is. And that's not to put the, the pressure on Chris because he, he did a great job when Chris, when uh, Giannis went down against Miami last year, He's done a great job this year when he's had to carry the load. We saw what he could do uh, uh, the game before last with the 20-point fourth quarter. But but Chris is the kind of guy that can, under certain circumstances, carry you. But Giannis takes so much pressure off of him because of the gravity he creates. And so it's a symbiotic type of relationship between the two. So we'll see. We'll see how it pans out. we got enough to do it. Uh, the question is, mentally, uh, will we be able to, to – to, to, kind of uh, quell this hawk juggernaut, this momentum they built this last ball game. So we'll see. It'll, 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 be, it'll be fascinating to see how it plays out either way. You start to look at players in today's generation, and I know you and I would go, oh, I remember back in the 70s or 80s, and guys would play and they would have you know injuries. Like there's load management here, but these guys are in the best shape. They got nutrition. They got trainers. They got private travel. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out, is it just a coincidence that we have these injuries here? If if I have load management, then should we be having as many injuries as we have? And and there's some, some you can't prevent. But I didn't think that Anthony Davis was in shape. 
I didn't think that James Harden was in shape this year. And you got load management. So what is the difference in generations, you know, with these guys and how they prepare and how you did, you know, back in the 70s or 80s? Well, it's interesting because we worked harder. Like myself, for example, guys used to hate to work out with me because I, I worked really hard, especially, I mean, leapfrogs with 25 pound weights behind my back. So now I'm paying the price. So now I've got <laughs> I've got all kinds of disc issues and hip issues and everything. You know, I was talking to Giannis probably two years ago, and I asked him about his off season workouts i mean how much he ran and did he run beaches and hills and he's like no no i just do a lot of defensive slides and i play a lot of basketball and so it's a he lifts a lot of weights and does a lot of cardio stuff in terms of the machines and equipment and that's that type of stuff too but it's a different approach but also dan i mean this was the quickest turnaround you know all this stuff quick quickest turnaround in, in professional sports history from when the, the bubble season ended to when this season started uh the the, the condensed scheduling of the 72 games was as condensed as it's ever been, you're playing every other day. I mean, the, you know, these guys just, their bodies aren't used to that uh, kind of taxation on their skeletal system, if you will. And so I think a lot of that had to do with that. And, and so it's, but my point is that it's a give and take. So yeah, I worked out hard, did a lot of unconventional crazy stuff, leaper machines and all this other crazy stuff we had back in the day, but I'm paying the price for it now. These guys will probably not have as, as many post-career issues but this game of basketball when you're out there 40 minutes a game playoff intensity doing the things that you're doing i've always believed case in point with Giannis and chris middleton when, when coach bud first got to milwaukee they were playing just over 30 minutes a game yeah and my point was that when the playoffs get here man you go you're gonna be playing 40 minutes a game and so our people were like well, we've got other ways to compensate for that without putting a lot of pressure in the skeletal system and my thing has always been, man, you got to get out there and play. You can't, you can't manufacture anything that replicates playing on that hardwood, jumping, landing, coming up and down. It's not the jumping that gets you. Somebody told me it's like the landing, the constant landing and the pounding. And so um, it's just a different approach nowadays. And I think you're seeing some of the fallout from the quick turnaround that was necessitated, obviously, by the by the league needing to play a, a certain number of games to to get paid. So everybody wants to get paid, so it was necessary. He's Marcus Johnson, the Bucks TV analyst for Fox Sports Milwaukee, five-time NBA All-Star. Yeah, you start to wonder, you know, look at LeBron. He's got three extra seasons of playoff yeah. basketball in that body, which to do what he does and still be able to do that, I mean, that's, that's freakish. That's, that's crazy. I mean, it's not like Kareem – or Wilt or some of these other players. Like LeBron is bring the ball up the floor. Like he's, you know, it, it's a little bit different what we ask of LeBron than we do probably any other player in NBA history to be able to do it this long, this well. And uh, he continues to do it. What do you think of LeBron? <laughs> I love LeBron. I'm uh, my family between myself, my sons, Chris, Josiah, who's uh, the king of NBA Twitter right now. But, uh, no, we, we're, we're big uh, LeBron fans, and it's mainly because of a, a few things. I mean, just in terms of no scandal, no, you know, I mean, some, some, some comments on some, some, some issues or whatever that you could call it a question. But in terms of how he has conducted himself, how he's given back to his community, the school that he built in Akron, all that, I mean, that's great stuff. But more tangibly, what is he, 15, 16 years in, and he's still playing at an MVP level. Still, and, 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 and so I talked to Coach Wooden, uh, interviewed Coach Wooden, myself, Chris, and Josiah uh, for, for a piece I was doing um, about Coach Wooden. And, and we asked him about LeBron and Kobe. And this is going to get a lot of people upset, a lot of Kobe fans in Los Angeles in particular. But he, he felt like LeBron was more of his kind of a player because he was a pass first team guy and uh, was not looking to bring a lot of attention to himself. Now, that's not absolutely true but 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 i've always been a big lebron fan and the fact that he's 15 16 years in 36 years old whatever it is uh, the way he takes care of himself uh just just the uh persona that he exudes whether you like him or not in terms of the some of the stances that he takes he's taking stances he's taking stances and he's out there producing and even more tangibly as a basketball player he controls the game as well as anybody I've seen since Magic Johnson with the ball in his hands. And so to me, that's uh, uh, that's saying that's saying something. Magic's one of my all-time favorite 
uh, guys I played against and guys that I like to watch play. I mentioned that uh, you got quite a resume of uh, acting credits here. Uh, <laughs> you have you, you have a scene in one of my. It's it's I I don't like the movie per se because I didn't think they were believable as basketball players. But I loved your scene in White Men Can't Jump. Like I think I could take Wesley Snipe right now in hoops one on one. Woody looks like he had a little bit of game there, Marcus. But tell me how you got the role in White Men Can't Jump. Well, we did a we did a uh, film for a. Uh student film project for the American Film Institute up in the hills of Pasadena late at night. Myself and Nigel Miguel and Silk Kozer and all these actors. It was based on the life of Raymond Lewis, this great uh, LA um, legend, myth, you know, just myth in terms of a basketball player. And so um, Silk Kozer was good friends with Ron Shelton who wrote, the, who wrote the movie and they were casting for the part. And so Silk got me the audition. Now I, they sent me the, the sides, the, the the dialogue I had to use to read with, with Wesley Snipes. And I saw that there was a scene where my character pulled out a knife on Wesley Snipes. And so I'd seen a scene from a movie where this uh, protagonist uses a, a razor blade, a uh, straight razor. And so my dad was a barber. I went and got one of his razors and practiced kind of opening it up and with one hand. And so when it got to that part of the scene with Wesley, I did the whole thing and chased him around the, the audition room. And, and so Ron Shelton's like, yeah, man, that's great. Great. That's great. You got the part, but, but, but leave that, leave that friggin' blade at home next time. We got prop blades for that stuff. You're going you're gonna to kill somebody with that thing. And so, so, so I got the part like that. But, uh, but the other thing, Dan, that's interesting is that that, that character is based on a real life guy by the name of Reggie Harding. I wrote a screenplay, just finished it a couple of months ago, but just the, the research, was fascinating. He was one of the first high school of pro guys out of Detroit, out of Detroit, yeah. out of Detroit early sixties. But, but I talked to Dave Bing and Ray Scott, the coach of the year with the Pistons was a teammate of his, but, but Reggie was challenging Will Chamberlain. You're not the big man. I'm the big man. I'm gonna kick you behind. I'm a, this is during the course of a game. And so, uh, so, so, but, but, but it's just fascinating that, that, that led me to doing some research on who this character really was. He was he was heroin addicted. He got shot and killed on the streets of Detroit at 30 years old. Uh, he just crossed paths with Satchel Paige, uh, Goose Tatum, so many so many characters and so many great uh, uh, historical figures in, in, in sports. So uh, and he comes under- into a convenience store. He's seven feet tall. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. And, and you know they go uh, Reggie. And then he makes it seem like, no, that's not me. And that's that's what your scene is. That's what I see. And that's the first thing. One of the first first stories you would hear as an NBA player was that story. But Reggie Harding in true life had robbed that same store like five or six times. You know, he was robbing drug houses over and over again to get money. You know, and he'd go in with this mask on at seven feet tall. I'm like, come on, Reggie. He's like, this ain't me. This ain't me. So that's that's the name of the screenplay. This ain't me. Uh, but but uh, yeah, it, a tragic, tragic ending. But I had a lot of fun doing the movie and uh, worked with a lot of great people. And you're right, Woody. So Woody and I, quick story. First time we played together, uh, pick up basketball that just wanted us all to play at the at the Hollywood uh, Hollywood Rec Center. And so Woody called this bogus foul, Dan. So I'm like, come on, Woody, that was a bullcrap foul. So Woody's like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Why would you impugn my integrity? Why would you impugn my integrity? I was like, Woody, first of all, first of all, I went to Crenshaw. I have no idea what it means. Number two, <laughs> it was still a bullcrap foul. I just laughed, and we, we kind of bonded after that. But we had a ball, man. We had a ball doing that. I, that I movie. talked to Rosie Perez recently, and she said – she went out to lunch with Wesley Snipes and Woody Harrelson, and she said they got stoned. And and she said then they came back, and, I, you know, Ron Shelton wanted to make, you know, you guys were getting ready to shoot. She said they were stoned. And I don't know how they were able to act, but they were stoned. And I said, were you? And she goes, no, I, I couldn't. I, I, I couldn't. I would have been so paranoid. But she said those guys were stoned through most of the movie. Well, Woody had – had the um, the rap party, the big cast rap party at his his uh, crib out in Malibu, where he had the big teepee in the backyard, a real regulation size official Indian teepee. Of course, Native American teepee. Excuse me, my <laughs> wife's Native American. I got to be, be careful about that. But 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 he had the Native American teepee, and in the teepee, man, you go in there. You're not coming out the same person. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you're coming out a whole different dude when you after you leave out of that TV. So yeah, but we had a great time. Woody had some good stuff. <laughs> the best. Uh, hey, it's great to talk to you as always. Hope you're well and the family. And uh, thanks for thanks for your getting up early with us. Always a pleasure, man. Thank you. That's Marcus Johnson. White men can't jump. He was in Blue Chips, but he was in a lot of TV shows. Uh, L.A. Law, Boston Legal, uh, Hanging with Mr. Cooper. He was also a wonderful player at UCLA. Smooth, smooth player. Number 54. 